it was late at night and I was speeding along in the desert of Nevada and I was all alone. Kind of tired and hungry and I was Vegas bound when out of the sky came a light with no sound. Well, it's a bright colored thing, sort of shaped like sphere. I said, look here, John, it's time to get out of here. And wouldn't you know it was just my luck that my car stalled and it left me stuck. Well, I got right out to see what I could do. I was a shaking so bad I could hardly move. For in my headlights I saw my coming, and something made me froze and kept me from running. Well, it was two creatures all pale and white, two figures in my front headlights. Their heads were shiny and were very bare. In fact, there wasn't no hair anywhere. I gotta move, but something done got me froze and I can't run. I wanna leave. You see these aliens, they're shaking me up so I wanna move. Well, they started talking to me, not using their mouth. I stood there wishing, Lord, I was back down south. They asked me what I was going to do, and I said, unfreeze me, and I'm a-leaving you, because I got to move. But something's got me froze, and I can't run. I want to leave. These aliens, they're shaking me up some. I got to move. What I'm telling you about is an experience that I encountered in the desert in 1975 in Las Vegas. I was there on a promotion for a record and I was uh, coming from Nashville, Tennessee. I knew that in Nashville, uh, in Las Vegas, I'd be able to get the kind of attention I needed to get a record into the national charts and that's what it was all about. So in my uh, experience in Vegas, things began to go the wrong way because I began to realize that, hey, uh, I'm out here all of a sudden and I'm on a highway without any reason for being there. I had wandered out into the middle of the desert on a highway called Blue Diamond Highway. It was like I was in a mesmerized stage of mind, hypnotic stage of mind, and I just didn't know where I was at until I realized I was so far out that I was plumb out into the wilderness of the desert. I turned the car around and started back toward town. And as I turned the car around, I happened to look up in the sky, and about a thousand feet in the sky, I seen a cigar-shaped object that was blinking lights. It was a burnt orange color, and the light, lights were rotating all around it. As I seen it, I slowed down because I thought they were making a movie or something. And as I slowed the car down, the car died. I tried to crank it back up. It wouldn't crank. I pulled over to the side of the road, and I tried to start and nothing would work, but the headlights were burning. So I got out of the car immediately, run up, and I raised the hood, not taking my eyes off of the situation that was at hand because I keep seeing this hovering in the sky. Johnny, before we go any further, let me introduce you to our, uh, our audience here. This is Johnny Sands, <clears throat> one of the top uh, country western singers in the country. He's also a, a stunt artist, an escape artist, and he's had one of the best UFO experiences uh, that I vouch for. In fact, I first uh, interviewed uh, Johnny back in, I believe it was 1976 or 1975, just after the story broke in the, uh, was it the Las Vegas Sun? Yes. It was on the front page of the paper, right. and I know I got a, a copy of the paper, and I said, this is an incredible story, and it sounds authentic. And in those days, uh, we were writing for the national tabloids, like the Inquirer and all, and I called Johnny on the phone, and he told me re his remarkable experiences. And now he's going to tell you some of the uh, what happened to him that day, and some of the things that have happened to him in the 35 years that we haven't been in touch. Johnny, yes, good thank to be you. back with you. Yeah. All right, Johnny, uh, continue, continue with your story. Right. Uh, as I said, I, I got out of the car, could not get it off my mind about the spacecraft that was above me. I didn't realize it's a real spacecraft. I thought, like I said, a movie shoot. Uh, but at the same time, I had car trouble and I wanted to get this car fixed. So I began to take the, uh, the air filter off of the carburetor and uh, I heard a noise and when I looked around, a flash of light hit the ground and I could see two figures walking toward my headlights. Uh, they were about, uh, I don't know, 125, 150 yards away from me and they kept walking toward me in kind of a slow motion. I immediately wanted to get in the car and just lock the door if nothing else because I thought something happened, uh, that somebody was going to try to mug me or something was going on. So uh, I realized I couldn't move. 
I was, fro I was froze completely stiff. My body wouldn't move. My mind was functioning. I knew where I was at. I knew I was in a situation. I didn't know if it was fear that was causing me to get in the state of shock that I couldn't move or it was something that they were doing to me causing this thing. But as they approached me... Now, how, how far... Uh, first, I, I should explain also that uh, Johnny and I are speaking to you from the town of Tepe, Arizona. We were in town the last few days. We've been shooting an episode for the History Channel's UFO Hunters. And uh, Johnny and I are <laughs> two of the guests on, on the program that should be aired in a couple of uh, weeks. It's a remarkable story, and I want him to continue. Can you describe a little bit more to us the craft and how close it, it was to you? Okay. The craft was approximately, I only guess, uh, about 60 feet long. It was a cigar-shaped looking craft. And uh, it was, from what I could tell, it looked a burnt orange from the lights that was rotated. It was about a thousand feet in the sky, I'd say, mm. maybe a little lower. Uh, but it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was like it was just sitting still in the midair. Mm. And uh, I, I watched it, uh, but when that flash of light came, it, it was like a beam of light hit the ground. It was like a streak of lightning almost. Uh, this is when I seen the two figures. Now, did they come out of the craft or did they come out of the beam of light? It was like they come beam down through the light mm -hmm. uh, to the ground. Well, you it's must like, have been that scared. That light was like an elevator. You must have been in, in, incredibly shaken up by this. Well, I was shook up, and, and that, the fact that I couldn't move didn't make it no easier. Mm -hmm. and, and then trying to move, like I said, I didn't know it was the state of shock I was in. or You know... I'm not an easy, easy person to scare. Yo, now, you were, you were on a, a fairly well-traveled highway, is that correct? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, the Blue Diamond Highway is a, a kind of desolate road. Uh, yeah. I didn't know that at the time, but I later found out it really well. And to be alone, look... I, what, what time of morning was this? Oh, this was night. It, yeah. it was approximately, I'd say, 10, 10.30 uh, at night. And you, you were on your way to work in one of the casinos? I was, I was on my way to visit some of the casinos. Yeah. I knew some of the people that run the casinos. Yes. And promoting the record was to get a chance to get on stage in the casino, uh, get a chance to at least speak if I didn't get a chance to sing. And I wanted to visit the radio stations, the newspapers, and, yeah. and etc. Now, do you know, can you remember exactly what day this was? Uh, no, I can't tell you right yeah. off. Uh, uh, it was in January, I think, yeah. uh, right after Christmas, I know yeah, that. Yes, because uh -huh. we normally do our record promotion uh, right after Christmas, you get the holidays out of the way, and then you go. Uh, Christmas record starts yeah. getting off the market. Yeah. And now you, you you've played with some pretty top notch people over the years, correct? Over the years, I've been fortunate enough to do so. I've I've performed on the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, I've uh, traveled with people like Conway Twitty, uh, Willie Nelson, Merle Haggard, uh, Charlie Pride, uh, Barbara Mandrell, uh, some of the top names in the business, Charlie Daniels. Uh, I've worked in motion pictures as a stunt man. Uh, fortunate enough to work with Elvis Presley in a picture called Charo. Yeah. I was a stunt man. Worked with Elvis Presley in a picture called Rastabout. I worked in the old Wild Wild West with Robert Conrad and worked with Peter Fonda in Wild Angel. Yeah. So I don't scare too easy uh, because I've done some death, death, death defying yeah, stunts. Yeah. Didn't you tell me one time you hung upside down on the, uh, over the Grand Canyon? Over Snake River Canyon. Yeah. I hung 1,200 feet in the sky mm -hmm. and uh, one of the magazines, a subsidiary of the magazine you was working for, yeah. came out there and actually watched me do that event. Yes. And uh, when they, uh, that subsidiary, when they write good about you, you've done a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, uh, talk we're talking about the Weekly World News, which is, uh, yeah, of course, the, 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 com yeah, yeah. the comical version of the, uh, the tabloids. Yeah, uh, they're yeah. kind of like the National uh, Lampoon, but yeah. every once in a while they do a serious story, and yeah. they did a serious one when you were hanging out over the Grand Canyon. Like now, That's you started out this little interview here by... Uh, 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 singing a song or, or, or getting getting into a song that you just wrote. Do you have a name for that? Uh, the song is called The Blue Diamond Encounter. And uh, the song was help written by some men that I'm going to later tell you about in this uh, program. Yes, okay. Now, you've been in, uh, in kind of UFO retirement uh, for uh, 34, thir years. 34 years. I kind of found you even though everybody told me you were dead. Yeah. Uh, recently, when I got a call from the History Channel, and they wanted me uh, on their uh, UFO Hunter show to talk about um, my experience with the Men in Black, 
that's described in my UFO Silencer's book, uh, I suggested a couple, they want to know a couple of the people maybe I might recommend who had UFO experiences. And I thought about you, Johnny. I said, geez, you know, <coughs> I remember you telling the story, and it was a, a great story, and I hadn't heard from you in all these years, and you were kind enough to send me uh, a painting that they had done in, the, in one of the casinos of this alien. It's in the book. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, the painting got lost. It was used on the front page of the Rochester paper, and they never sent it back to me. And I said, <coughs> geez, I hope Johnny's not going to be mad. Uh, about that, but he'll surely remember me if nothing if nothing else, you know. So, I told the, the TV producers of the uh, UFO Hunters they should try to get in contact with you. I heard from I uh, got an email a couple of days ago, and they said, "Well, we'd like to have Johnny on, but he died." I said, "He died?" They said, "Yeah, he passed away apparently a couple of years ago." And I said, "Well, that's really a shame, you know." Uh, about three or four days after that, I went uh, down to Coney Island, you know, in in, in New York to see. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Zamora the Torture King, mm. who's also an escape artist and uh, sleeps on a bed of nails and eats glass, and all the things that we all enjoy doing. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he's a, a member of our Shaver Mystery Group, and he writes for Fate Magazine and some of these other publications. So I, I never met him. He lives out in, uh, uh, I think, uh, Vegas somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. somewhere out of yeah, Vegas, and he does shows out there. And I happened to mention about how I was doing this UFO Hunters program and how I wanted to get Johnny Sands, but we can't get him, he's dead. And so, some more, the torture kick says to me, well, he ain't dead. I just talked to him a few months ago. In fact, I wrote a, uh, he had written a book, uh, Weird Nevada, and he said, the story's in there. He said, just look for him on MySpace. So, sure enough, I told the guys, the History Channel, I said, the guy's not dead, look for him, he's on MySpace. And they, they found you and they contacted you, and so here we are in the Tempe um, Hotel here uh, after shooting... Uh, all this uh, about 12 or 14 hours we shot uh, a program today and we're here talking about some of these experiences so finish this up but I want to also too before we spend the whole hour which is what we have here uh, talking about the old stuff I want to get into some of the new stuff but let's let, let's continue on with your your, uh, your story now well let me finish one off yeah. for you right now about okay. the dead part uh, I'm going to just tell you like the old country boys say they scared the living hell out of me, but I ain't dead yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, no, I, I appreciate you getting me on that program, yeah, too. Yeah, well, uh, you have a look, incredible story, which I believe in. 34 years, I did hold this story back, because simply because, like I said, I was out there to promote a record at the time. And uh, when I got this situation at hand come into my life, it really went against what I was trying to do because people would have took the fact that I was trying to promote a record that I was using this as a scam to pull me up the ladder and get me to where I was trying to go. So, in well, other words... We all know that UFOs are a career booster. Yeah, they're real killers. <laughs> I mean, you sell major magazines every day. But, but people always look for reasons to not or make yes. disbelief out of something. Yes. So, rather than go forward with my record, I put it on hold so I could get this situation out of my life. But here they were, whether I liked it or not, and they were walking toward me, and I couldn't go anywhere. And I knew I was froze, and I knew something was wrong. As they approached me, uh, I could see that they were, as the picture shows you here, this is a, as good a description. This was a, a very professional artist at the Sahara Hotel uh, did a rendition of them as I explained it to them. And if you'll notice, they have gills on the side of their face. Uh, and uh, these gills, they don't have ears, but they do have a nose. And uh, so these things come into question. But as they approached me, the strangest thing about it all was when they spoke to me, one done the talking, and when he spoke, he didn't talk, his mouth didn't move. So I'm looking to see how this guy's talking to me, and the only thing I could see was... There was a light on, on like some kind of a buckle belt that he had on, and it looked like when it, he was talking, it was translating like he was using mental telepathy mm -hmm. and talking through that with the thoughts of his mind. Did you, did you feel like they were probing your mind? I mean, could you feel something inside of your own mind? Or? Uh, no, I, they, they, I'll tell you, the fear of the thought that I was actually under capture by something that I didn't know what. Uh, and to know that I couldn't get away, and not to know what they were going to do with me. Because I'd heard of people, you know, saying I'd been in, abducted and carried into a spacecraft, and they run needles in their bellies and things of this nature. So I didn't know what these people's going to do. Uh, I don't know where they're from. I mean, I asked them. I, I could speak. 
I said, where are y'all from? And he pointed and said, up there. But that's all he said. Then he asked me where I was from and why I was there. And they asked me questions about uh, why so many people were there. Did you Vegas. explain to him the slot machines? I told him about the gambling. <laughs> and uh, in fact, one of the columnists out in uh, Las Vegas Sun said, I hope he told him about the gambling. I told him. I said, they're a bunch of suckers. They fall for anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, but I did say, uh, I said, it's a, it's a gambling. It's a recreation. I said, people yeah. like entertainment. And I says, uh, that's what they're here for. They act like they understood that fact. Loose change and loose women. Loose change and loose women, that's good. Uh, so I said to him, I said, look, uh, if you just un let me go here, I'll eat. I'll go right now. And uh, he said, and pray on Sunday. And, and he said that uh, we're going to talk to you again. We'll see you again. And uh, so when he said he'll see you again, I knew right then. Uh, these people were coming back, and I knew that was a change that I was going to get to go the night. He brushed me across the shoulder like this with his hand, and as he did that, I could feel my body. It was like you slept in a bed all night on the wrong side. That's with all me. That crap, and start loosening up a little bit. I began to loosen up. They turned and walked away from me. You know what you didn't tell us about, though? Tell us about the ball that they took out from behind their back. The globe? The globe, the miniature Earth. The globe. Yeah, they went behind their back. Don't you remember, Johnny? They came out with this miniature Earth and passed their hand over it? And the miniature explosions went off? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's in the story. The globe? They, they had... They, you, you, you had told me that they had put their hands behind their back and they came out with this big ball that looked like the Earth and they passed their hands over it and all these miniature explosions went off. Uh, I don't. Yeah, that was that was part that was that's in the book. That's what you told me originally, and in they the they had warned over some nuclear holocaust or something like that. Oh, uh, I don't know. I yeah. don't remember. I don't know. Uh, I, no, I didn't tell you that. Uh, well, anyway, go on. Go on. No, I, I know I didn't tell you that yeah. because uh, uh, everything that I wrote that uh, I I wrote a song called "Going Up in Smoke." Yeah, that the world was going to end. Mm -hmm. uh, that that I had written, but I don't know if somebody combined that yeah. with what we're talking about here. But no, 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 I didn't. Uh, oh, anyway, go on I, with the story. I don't know yeah. about that. Um, but they 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 asked me some questions that I didn't reveal. Uh, that that they asked me not to say, mm -hmm. uh, and so I didn't answer those questions, and I haven't answered those questions. Uh, so when I didn't answer those questions. Uh, I feel like that I've done what I was supposed to do as far as whatever they had in mind. At least I'm alive. So when he brushed me and walked, he turned to walk away, I was thawing out, so to speak. When he got to, back to about the same location where he was at, uh, he began to, uh, uh, they began to go out of sight just like a cape. And I looked up, the craft was there. I could move. I slammed the hood on the car. I jumped in the car. Without thinking anymore, I, I turned the key and the car cracked. I put it in gear, and as I put it in gear, I looked up, and that craft went like a dynamite streak right out of sight. I mean, it was bang, gone like that. So I came to town. Uh, first, I called the police department, and I told them about the experience I'd had, told them about the situation. And they said, well, we can, we've we had sightings all night. Uh, uh, of the cigar shaped thing and said so, so we don't doubt what you say is true but you need to talk to the Air Force so I called another Air Force base out there and uh, they put me through to a man and they said that he was the they used to be in charge of a blue book mm -hmm. which I didn't know what a blue book yeah, was yeah. Mm -hmm. but they said that the blue book was no longer in service so they discontinued it and they said oh, you need to contact the Aero Phenomenal Research Center so I was still feeling strange about it all, and I didn't know for sure. Maybe I was having some kind of uh, delusions or something. So I went to the hospital, and uh, I asked them to check me. I told them what happened to me, and so they admitted me. And uh, from the hospital bed, I, I contacted the Aero Phenomenal Research Center in Tucson, Arizona. That was J Jim and Carl Lorenzo. Yeah, and uh, so I told them what happened, and they says. 
we have a man in town that we'd like to uh, introduce you to. His name's John Romero. And they said, uh, we'll get you a job and we'll see what we can do. So uh, uh, he said, but it sounds like you've had a true encounter. Well, when I got out of the hospital after they said nothing's wrong that they could find, uh, he said, you probably just didn't shock County a little bit from it, but you're going to be fine. Uh, I went to see John Romero. He was the director of the uh, Sahara Hotel. And uh, John listened to what I was telling him. And he said, would you be willing to take a lie detector and a voice analysis uh, from an FBI expert? And I said, yes, I'd be glad to. He said, well, it may help you out. It may, if it was your imagination, we'll be able to find it out. And if it was something really happened, we'll be able to know that too. And I said, well, I'll be more than happy to do it. So I set it up with a, to be with R.L. Nolan, which was a FBI, I think he worked with the FBI for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so I got with him, and uh, he told me I'm going to ask these questions, and I just want you to answer the truth with them. So he asked me, did I meet two strange figures in the desert? And I told him yes. And he said, did they talk to you without using their mouth? And uh, I said, yes, I did. And he says, uh, uh, was this something that, that was pre-enacted or something that somebody put together? And I said, no, it wasn't. And... Uh, Anyway, after he asked me all the questions, uh, he come back in and he says, you have answered this 100% correct. You are telling the truth. And the voice analysis, he said also. So after that, I was asked to come back to the Sahara Hotel and get an artist. Uh, they were going to bring in an artist and do a rendition of the aliens where I'd right, seen. Right. And so this is where this guy came from. And as they were setting to draw these pictures, uh, two men approached me. Uh, we were roped off in an area, and these two men approached me. And uh, while we were, I was trying to explain why they had gills. I said, I don't really know why they got a nose and gills. And uh, one of them leaned over kind of awkwardly. I mean, like he was out of balance. He was dressed in black. Mm -hmm. His hair was slick straight back, a lot of greasy look to it. He looked real Caucasian, real uh, squinched eyes, uh, real shiny uh, eyes, dark shiny eyes, and uh, but very uh, very pierced eyes. Mm -hmm. And he leaned over and said, "Let me help you." He says, "They are probably from a planet known as Sirius." Mm -hmm. He says, "Sirius is eight and a half light years from this planet," and said, "In the orbit of Sirius." is some, uh, a planet where it's known to be an Aquarius type planet. And said, but it's very hot there. And so what they would be doing was be living part-time underwater and part-time on land so they would breathe through the nose on land, breathe through the gills underwater. And, now, uh, this person that approached you and said this to you, do you think he was something other than a, uh, a an Earth person? Well, at that's that particular moment I didn't because at the particular moment he just answered the question it sounded uh, more uh, I didn't know where Sirius was. Did he identify himself? Oh no he didn't identify himself mm -hmm. and the guy with him never spoke. The guy with him was dressed just like him and he stood over this way. I thought maybe they uh, the, the clothing didn't look up to par I mean up to date but I thought maybe you know they're from another country and just don't quite understand how we got things together. Yeah, you, you, know, you don't here. dress like they that. Ain't you go got to Vegas. Yet, there you go. So uh, no rhinestones for that. Yeah, guy. that yeah, was yeah. gone. So, uh, but I, I, I was curious because he would lean in my face to talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, after he answered that question, the other one was looking. They were looking at each other, making signals like they were communicating uh, what we figured out later without talking. And so he looks at him and looks at me. He says, we got to go now, but we'll see you again real soon. Well, that's what the aliens had told me. That was the last words they said. We got to go, but we'll see you soon. So you kind of thought there was a connection maybe. Well, immediately I did. And uh, I had an ex-police officer with me from Philadelphia. He had heard what I had told the lie detectors and he told what I told them. Now, was this the same night or the following night? No, this was uh, about... Uh, two nights after yes, the actual okay. event. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Well, so, you, 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 your story uh, made it, uh, it was on the front page of the newspaper. It was on the newspaper there, the uh, mm -hmm. Vegas Sun. Was it on the TV as well? Uh, yeah, it was on TV. Mm -hmm. It was on TV. So and people then for a couple of days maybe might have recognized you if they were passing you by. Uh, yeah, they would have known me. Yeah. They, probably. Uh -huh. uh, but they, they wouldn't have known about Sirius. No. Uh, oh, no, uh, no. The, and, and, but the other thing is, when, when they had, said that we'll see you soon, I, I t the police officer looked at me and said, did you hear what they said? You said the same thing a million said to you. I said, I know. And he said, well, have them follow. So security was standing over there. We said, would you mind following them fellas to see where they go and see who they are? And so he followed. And they were approximately uh, uh, eight feet in front of the, secu uh, uh, the security guard. And they went out the side door, which is actually for entertainers to go out. And they didn't go out the front door like the normal people would have yes. done. Mm -hmm. And so nobody was in that hallway but them and the security guard. When they got to the double doors, they pushed them open. The security guard made about seven more steps, and he went through them. And he turned around and walked back in. And he looked pale as, as this alien did. Yes. And he says, they disappeared. And uh, I says, what do you mean disappeared? He said, they gone. I mean, they, they gone. They vanished. I mean, like in midair. He says, I don't understand it. He said, there's no cars. There's no nothing there. And there's nowhere for them to hide. They're gone. And uh, so that really began to make us really think, who are these? What is this? And so I'm thinking maybe it's government. I don't know what it is. I think it's some kind of a thing that they're fixing to uh, try to nail me to the wall, thinking I'm trying to pull some kind of hoax or something. So anyway, I told John, I said, let's go home. So on my way home, John took every alley, back alley, side street, everything he could, looking back in the rear view to make sure no one was following us. No one was. And when we finally got to where our, our apartment was, uh, we got out of the car, and no one got out of the car. A long black Cadillac limousine drove up down the road, and the passenger side and the back seat windows rolled down. And the men that were in the hotel stuck the head out, leaned and looked out the window. They had another guy in the car driving. Then they rolled the windows up and drove off. Well, that really bothered us and began to bother John. Now John was a sparing partner with Leon Spinks. So John was no little pushover. John was a very tough man and he fought crime and worked against uh, drug lords and everything else in Philadelphia. So he didn't scare easy, but this was beginning to scare him. And he said, this is getting to be something strange here. So anyway, I was contacted at John's house. Uh, nobody knew John's number. Nobody knew about this. We wouldn't publicize in this thing. We was trying to get away from it rather than get with it. And uh, by a man who called himself Dave Dunn. He said, I'm with a production company out of Hollywood, and we want to do a documentary and go out there and help you with this thing. Maybe we can get to the bottom of it all because we're going to investigate and we're going to help you out and make it go away if that's what you want. I said, yeah, I want it to go away. And he said, well, if you'll meet with us, we'd like to meet with you and we'll discuss what we want to do. So he gave us a, an address and a, an apartment number to where to come to. And so I told John uh, to go with me. And so we wrote it down and we went mm -hmm. the next morning. Uh, when we got into that, uh, knocked on the door, uh, this Caucasian looking man opened the door. He wasn't dressed in black, he had a turtleneck sweater, it was kind of grayish black on. And uh, he invited me in. As I come in, there was another man at the door, so, I mean, it was standing against the bar, and uh, one at a door that would lead into another room. Uh, they never spoke. Uh, this guy called himself Dave, asked me to sit down on the couch. I said, they had just luxurious furniture in this place. Mm -hmm. Looked like he'd come from England, heavy duty, brilliant looking, looked like hand car stuff. Ancient looking. They wanted to be your handler. <coughs> handler? Handler, they, they, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they wanted to be your handler. I yeah. mean, they wanted to handle you. They thought they could make some money maybe off of this, or? Well, I, well we didn't know what was yeah. going on. Yeah, well, they did. You know, they didn't know that UFO people are... 
it's not a way to make a capitalize. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Uh, they were well, they were fishing, as you oh, say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they, so they, uh, they invite me in. It, 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 instead of having gills, they have dollar signs in their eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, now they uh, they said that without a doubt, they said, "I'll tell you, uh, uh, we believe what you're saying, and uh, we want to film this thing and go out there." And they asked me, "Would I go back to the location?" And I said, "Yes, I will." Mm-hmm. And so they said, uh, uh, "What you ought to do is write a song about this experience." And I said, "Well, I, I really don't." There've been there been some terrible songs about UFOs uh, over the years. Some of them country western, some of them not. I mean, there maybe there've been a, a couple. It was UFO and the trucker? I think I remember heard heard one singing on the country western uh, station. I never heard it. Well, they they are. There are songs about uh, UFOs. Yeah, well, none they, of them were hits that yeah. I don't take up. Well, maybe the Purple People Eater was the closest. <laughs> well, that one was a hit. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, they said we're well, right one, and I said, well, I was thinking they wanted it for the the documentary. Yeah. But so I said, well, I work on that, and they said you work on that this evening, and we'll see you tonight. Mm-hmm. So I went back, and we started writing on the song. Well, I put uh, that night. Uh, I got most of the song done and the next morning I got with uh, uh, this uh, Dave Dunn again I went back and you know, he, was he a middle aged man or uh, he looked to be in his 40s uh, mm-hmm. uh, clean cut yeah very clean cut uh-huh. but Caucasian looking too yeah uh, spoke regular English though no, no yeah, accent spoke, anything no like accent, that yeah. no and uh, so I came back and played him some of the song he told me to change these words say sphere uh, he said and uh, tell about them talking to you without using their mouth he said this is very important and be sure and tell them about the 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 uh, uh, being froze yeah yeah and and uh, so I put all that together with it and anyway that night I met with him so I didn't get a chance for him to hear the final version uh, so we were supposed to meet you to De- desert Inn hotel and so I went out to the Desert Inn and uh, I met with him. I, I was supposed to go in and meet him in the lobby. and uh, But we couldn't get to the lobby because we were about three blocks away in the parking lot uh, because of so many people there. And so John was with me. And so well, I said, we'll walk up to the lobby. And so when we started uh, to get out of the car, the Cadillac limousine pulled up and it was Dave Dunn stepped out. And he had a, a, a martini glass in his hand. He said, hey. And I said, how in the world did you find me? He said, because we was looking for you. And uh, he said, look, I got this for you. And he handed me a martini. And then he reached back in and he handed out another was glass. And he martini? says, I have one for your friend. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he gave it me one and him one. He said, y'all get in. So I got in the back seat with me and John. And there's another guy in the back seat and the driver and Dave Dunn in the front seat. And uh, he said, we're going to the desert. So we went out to Blue Diamond Road. Well, he said, tell me when you get to that location. And well, when we got there, I said, it's right here. Mm. Well, he didn't answer me. They kept going. And I said, Dave, it was back there, right back there, turn around. They kept going. I kept saying it to him, hey, did you hear what I'm saying? I mean, it's like they were in a trance then. And so they drove about six miles. Past the, the vent where yeah. you had this. And then they turned around, made a U-turn in the road, and pulled over to the uh, other side of the road, headed back to Vegas. And when they parked, they said, we'll be back in a minute. And they got out of the car. And I said, what's going on? Well, when they got out of the car, all these lights started shining on us. And then here come these people stepping out. And they were all in black, and you couldn't see them because they, uh, they were behind the headlights, but when they stepped in front of them, they were all standing there, and between 25 and 30 of them. You know, Will Smith got nothing on you. <coughs> no, he do not No, no, uh-uh. uh-uh. Little ray gun, little aliens, uh, yeah. weird looking, nothing like this. Nothing like that. <laughs> and, uh, but they were arguing about me. Uh-huh. And, and there was one leader, he seemed to be stronger than the rest, and he kept pointing his finger at the car, and he says, he knows too much. you got to cut this off. It's got to end now. So now, these, these, how many of them do you think there were, these men? 25 or 30. Uh, there were lights strung up for 100 feet uh, yeah. across. 
Point and that is. Now, did they all look the same? I, you really couldn't tell. You couldn't tell. They were no, just kind no. of figures, yeah. And, and you, could you make out any of the vehicles or they were just the lights? You couldn't much? see the vehicles yeah. at all. Uh, nothing but headlights. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it looked like they were vehicles, cars. Could they but, have been UFOs? Uh, no, I would no, think. No. I, I would think they're cars. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but being so many of them is what, what kind of got to us. And uh, so, anyway, after the argument, I, I, I said to John, John said, looks like something you got somebody stirred up. I said, yeah, I'm going to get out of here and see what the problem is. And so I started so you, to get uh, you have a legitimate witness to this? Oh, yeah. I, is he still alive? No, John got killed here about two years ago uh -huh. in Vegas. Uh, he got Did he ever sign any affidavits or anything? To oh, he talked, he talked with other people. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He talked with uh, several people. He talked with John Romero. He talked with several people. Is John Romero still alive? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because they talked to him today, the UFO Hunters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, there were several other people that, that were, were, you know, heard and verified what John mm -hmm. had to say about it. In fact, John talked to my wife about it, so uh, he said it was the most uh, frightening experience he'd ever been through in his life. And he said, I've been through some pretty tough things. In fact, he died, a man tried to rob him and shot him through the roof of the mouth. And uh, he was supposed to fall dead. Instead of falling dead, he brought the come back up, brought the man to the ground, wrestled him down, reached in his pocket, got a pocket knife out, and stabbed him bad enough that the guy had to go to the hospital to get care, and that's how they caught the man that murdered him. Mm -hmm. So he was a pretty tough cookie. Uh, but uh, Okay, but now here, com here comes the strangest part of the story. Yeah, yeah, as I started to get out the door to go out to talk to these men, something looked like from the Adams family, the it, the little fuzzy creature, mm -hmm. run up to my door, and I seen another second one standing. So I slammed the door back. And I looked at John and I said, did you see that? He said, it looked like a cactus running into the car. I says, it's some kind of a fuzzy looking thing out there. He says, well, don't open that door. I said, well, I ain't going to open the door. And I said, but there's two of them standing there. And I says, you know, I don't know what's going on here. Uh -huh. Well, he thought maybe they had spiked the, the martinis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I was beginning to think maybe he's right, but I know all these people over here are arguing and fussing about us. Well, about well, you that can time, tell you can usually tell when you're a lucid, you, you know. When yeah, you're, I don't when know you feel, smart, you know, but yeah, you can tell. We didn't you know, feel yeah. like we were. We yeah. felt like we were in a situation yeah. that was yeah. something was going wrong. Yeah, yeah. But all of a sudden, they turned and they come back to the car. So I figure we'll get the answers when they get in. So they get in the car. The guy gets in the back with John. Now, John would be normally the guy, though, this is strange, to want to reach over and grab him by the neck and say, look here, Joker, we're about fed up with this stuff. But John was real mild and mellow about it. Uh, John was kind of set back listening for answers more than, more than anything. And I said, Dave, what's going on? He never answered me. I says, you know, is it something we've done wrong? He never answered me. Nobody spoke. We drove back to the desert. Now, the, what happened to the cars that were parked there, the, the, the men and black guys? They the just, lights went off? The or? lights went off, and we drove off. Mm -hmm. uh, they never left. I never seen them. We never yeah. seen them. As we went down the road, we never seen them more of them. Uh, what time of night was this? Was it after midnight? Uh, no, it was around 10, 30, 11, 30, yeah. something like that. Uh, so uh, we tried to make it so, similar to the time that it actually... Uh, yeah, I see. Okay. So, all, right, all right, so now they took you back into town. Uh, yeah, back to the Desert Inn. Uh, we got in our car. They still didn't speak, so I just got out of the car. So I said, well, maybe I don't know what his problem is. Well, it sounds like they might have been under a little bit of mind control or something uh, there, right? Well, I don't know what it was at the time, but I know something wasn't right. So I talked to John when we got home. I said, look, we need to go over and see this guy in the morning and find out what the deal is and what's going on. So the next morning, early, we got up, and we got dressed and went over there. And I'm knocking on the door, and uh, I keep knocking, nobody won't answer the door. And the maintenance man come, coming up the hall says, could I help you? I said, no, nah, we're here to see Dave. And uh, he said, Dave who? I said, Dave Dunn with the production company. He said, there ain't no Dave Dunn this year. I said, yeah, he said, this right here, we've been up here before. And John said, yeah, this is the right apartment. And he said, no, you got it confused. Nobody lives in that apartment. 
And uh, I said, sir, we're not trying to make a lie out of you, but yes, this is the apartment. So he says, uh, I'll take you to the landlord. So he took us down to the landlord. Well, I was getting a little ruffled up. I said, look, lady, I know where I went. I've been up there twice. I said, I sat down in the couch chair in front of the big fireplace you got in the room. I said, John here was with me. John can verify it. John said, well, I've got it wrote down where he told us to come, and we, we certainly couldn't get the wrong number. And I said, I described the whole room. I described it to her. I said, they had the living room, kitchen, and the dining room over here. And I said, there was some kind of bedroom back out in going in. But I said, there's this beautiful wood-carved uh, fireplace in there with a big mirror over it. And uh, she said, well, come with me. So we went back up to where that apartment was. She said, you know, it's really strange. She said, she pushed the door and she said, you've been in this room before. She said, because you described it to a T. And I looked at the fireplace, it's all in place. Only thing was, she said, where's that furniture you was telling me about? There was no furniture at all. Now, this stuff was heavy. Well, now, we you, left we've, them. Heard, we've, heard, we've heard similar stories about this where people have gone back to like the meeting uh, place. Uh, and, and one particular incident, the room was actually filled with cobwebs. And it was a house mm -hmm. uh, on the outskirts of town. They had gone uh, back to see this person who was uh, you know, involved in a UFO experience. Mm -hmm. And the person was gone and the house was filled with cobwebs and dust. And it looked like it hadn't been lived in for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what got us was when we got back, maybe 11.30, might be close to 12. But... We got back, they still had to drive all the way back to, to where they were at, which mm -hmm. was far on the other side of the town. Uh, they had to get over there. They, there was no way to get a rental truck at that time of night, uh, no. even in Vegas. No, no, no. And, uh, and we were there at the break of day, so they couldn't, the size of this Par furniture. Parall uh, parallel universe. You couldn't have moved. walked through the door right into another dimension. You yeah. think that's possible? It was gone. It was gone. It was gone. And so that that was enough to let me know that this thing was, was something else. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, people can believe what they want to believe. It, it, it done more damage to me than good because uh, for 34 years I, I, I've quit talking about it and, and it wasn't that great of an experience to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I sing the song now because, hey, the actual men in black helped me write that song. According to all figures, I believe there were men in black. Yeah. Where they're from, I don't quite understand. What, what did you What did you think of the uh, the uh, Hollywood movies, from the Men in Black? Oh, uh, that was more of a joke to me than yeah. anything. Yeah, you know? uh, these. But obviously, all these stories, uh, your experience, and everybody else had it's enough effect. That, yes. Yeah, yeah, Ca uh, caused them to yeah. make the movie. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and there's lots of experiences that's went on out there that people won't tell uh, simply because they just don't want to be insulted or embarrassed about the fact that they've seen it because they think it makes them abnormal because they've seen something unusual. Okay, so for 34 or 35 years, you very seldom discussed the subject. Very seldom. But your career, you went on with your career doing uh, stunt work, uh, singing all over the country, doing benefits. Uh, and, and and so forth, but other things did happen to you during oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had several experiences where I've seen other crafts. Uh, I would have fireballs come at me. I had a fireball come at me that was bigger than two cars, uh, and I had uh, six people in the car with me that night, and it was coming out now, of the where, sky. Where was this, uh, Johnny? Uh, we were in North Carolina. And, uh, Near the Brown Mountain, we by were, any chance? I had a whole band in my yeah. car. Yeah. Uh, no, we were down in uh, close to uh, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but all of a sudden, this thing come at that car, and we thought it was a meteorite coming out of the sky. But it, as it come, it come in a straight line right toward the car, and when it got right at the car, it lifted right up over top of the car. It put everybody in the whole car except the driver, that was me, in the floorboard. I was ducking, but when I when they raised up and looked back, it had gone. It disappeared. So it was like it just come out boom, and it disappeared right there over the top of the car. Before. It never seen it come to the back of the rear of the car. So and it wasn't a meteorite. Meteorite don't turn and make curves and all. So uh, that experience and then I seen the craft uh, 
uh, about a hundred and 150 foot off the ground uh, that was approximately 200 foot long and probably 150 foot wide. Where, where that's a that's a large size object. That was a big object. And, and where was this? Well, it, we were on our way to visit a friend of mine's church, and uh, Gail was with me that night, and we we were riding, and there was there was a known uh, cornfield there that that had an old old cabin out in the middle of it, and uh, uh, again, where was this say, now? This was in North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. And uh, so on that way to that church, I looked up and I said, good gracious, they have built some kind of major kind of tower thing out here. I said, look at that. And she looked, she said, Lord, what is that thing? Well, lights was going around and around on it. And uh, so... A regular circus in the sky. Oh, this was a uh, humongous. This looked like a football field in the sky. Uh -huh. And uh, so... I, I rolled the window down and looked up I, because I, I says, I can't see what they built here because it wouldn't make it no racket. And uh, I said, that gets me. Well, the church was only maybe another block up the street out in the middle of nowhere. So we pulled on into the church parking lot and I got out. The first thing I done was walk around there to see what that was. And I said, it's still there. So I went into church. I said, y'all want to see something? Come out. So I brought the people out of the church on the porch. And I said, look over there at that thing. And they said, what in the world? And about that time, that thing took off and phew, it was out of sight and gone. Uh, any sound? No sound whatsoever. No sound from any of these no, objects? No, not even a wind noise. It just gone. So how do you think they propel themselves? That's what's incredible because, listen, they say that some of these crafts that they've seen don't even have rivets in them. As they made out of some kind of a alloy. Well, now, did you see beyond the lights? So, I mean, did you actually see structure and... Uh, 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 it, it was dark uh, underneath yeah. this this large thing. But, I mean, just Nothing in general, like on the, on the first one. It was you... more like a sh shatter in the sky with lights on it. Mm -hmm. It's a big... On the first one, I could see the, the body structure. It was more cigar-shaped looking. Mm -hmm. It was round, uh, uh, and and the lights would make the... The color of it, but no sound, no sound there either. No, no, there was no sound. It, it was like looking at a, a good Goodyear blimp with a, a whole lot of lights on one, uh, a little longer than a Goodyear blimp, but something similar to that. So, what do you, what do you make out of all this? I mean, first of all, is there a? Do you think they picked you randomly? Did they select I, you? I I don't know. I've you know asked myself. Yeah, I think they picked me because hey. I found myself wandering in the desert where I was, should have been at a, at a casino mm -hmm. uh, doing promotions. Uh, so that I, might have cured some I, people of drinking and gambling. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I felt I felt led. Yes, uh, I felt that uh, I don't know maybe because what I did that they thought I might be the kind of person could I answer the, the word or would spread the word. Yeah, uh, but what what was the word? Uh, well, the word was that they were real and they were coming. Mm -hmm. And they were coming soon. So, are they futuristic? Are they something that's uh, meant to to be seen in in, in a large scale uh, that we're going to hear uh, on a daily basis about? I, I don't know. I think the government's tried to hide it for years and years, and I think they've done a poor job of that. And uh, I, I know without a doubt that they are real. Mm -hmm. Now, where are they from? They may be from the earth here. They may be from the center there. They may be from some foreign country. But they got some powerful, powerful, powerful stuff that we don't have. They're much powerful than any country in the world. And uh, I believe if it, we had to stand against them in a war, we wouldn't stand a fight and change a challenge, change in hell. What do you do? You feel that they're a threat? Uh, uh, no, I don't feel the threat from them. Uh, at this point in life, I don't, I, I don't understand them. It's kind of like uh, I, I told a preacher one time. I don't know if they're from heaven, and I don't know if they're from hell. Uh, it could be like Willie Nelson wrote the song. It could be angels flying too close to the ground is the reason some of them's crash. We don't know. Uh, the Bible in Ezekiel speaks of a, a whirling whirlwind, and it speaks of a spacecraft landing on the earth, uh, right in Ezekiel. So. Did they come then? Have they been coming for generations after generation? 
the Egyptians say that they seen uh, a craft shaped like an ark landed and it brought come down from the planet called Sirius, mm. which Sirius wasn't even known uh, to the astronomers till in the 70s when they built a telescope that they could pick it up uh, with. So how did the Egyptians know about a planet called a, a, a star called Sirius with planets around it? Uh, they knew it long before there was any telescopes. Uh, Africans believed in the Sirius planet too, and they talked about mermaids and mermen uh, that lived underwater and on land, and they come down in this ark like craft and landed on the earth, and uh, so they worshipped them like gods. So, who knows what we got in store for us? Uh, but there's a, a, like you say a little bit there, there's a wonder of reality in this thing. And for those that don't believe, uh, they'll see. And for those that do believe, keep looking up because we're going to see a lot more of it. Now, do you, these beings that you saw, they seem rather unique. Have you heard of any other uh, encounters where people have seen these beings with gills and all? You. Gills, you know, on the side of their head, the way they looked, and uh, no, I ain't never no, seen nothing like that. No, you, you've 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 never heard of any other? Uh... No, no, not no others. Uh, I, I, well, I don't know that. I don't listen to a lot of the UFO stories, uh, so I don't know if I've ever heard of. Because yeah. uh, now we have a lot of reports, as you probably know, of objects uh, being seen submerging into uh, bodies of water and shooting out. Uh, some of our own uh, naval uh, vessels and all have been actually yeah. buzzed by UFOs and then they'd be seen going underneath the uh, the ocean again? Yeah. Uh, and I did tell you something I want to apologize to you. I wasn't supposed to say that. What, sir? About the ball. You weren't? I wasn't. That was one of the things that I wasn't supposed to say. And I didn't even realize I'd ever told yes. nobody. Y yes. I didn't realize I'd ever told nobody about that. I, I, the only person that I thought I'd ever told that was John Worth. Uh, I didn't even tell the uh, the polygraph people about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but yes, that was. Yeah. That was true. Uh, but they had something that they added to that, and I'm sure it ain't in his book. I'm going <laughs> to read to find out. Uh, yeah. No, I didn't tell that to anybody. Yeah. So... Uh, you must have had a good persuasion way. Well, right? you kind of put me in shock when you brought that up. Because did, yeah, I noticed no, that. Yeah, nobody yeah. knew about that. Yeah, uh -huh. And nobody's ever asked me that question. Uh -huh. And when you said that to me there, uh, I didn't want to tell you a lie, but I just saying, how's he got now? Nah, wait uh -huh. a minute. He's now, working for them. <laughs> in fact, you're dressed in black right now. There, there you go. So yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. We don't know what yeah. you're doing here. <laughs> but no, serious, uh, I didn't really know I ever told that. Yeah, yeah. But there was a couple of things that were a little frightening. And honestly, why I didn't mention that was because that to me looks real frightening. Uh, it's like they're showing that there's going to be some kind of disasters. Uh, in a world relationship, yes, uh, and I never really understood it in its completeness. Uh, but, but yet, yet, yet they they say these things say, sometimes, Johnny. In years and years and years pass by, and it doesn't happen. Yeah, but if you noticed in my interview today, I didn't put that in there. No, you didn't. No, uh, because I made sure I did, and, and I don't even see. Yeah, I really don't even know when I let that go then, because it look. I'll tell you, and that's why I told you about it. I wrote a song called yeah. Wars and Killings. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Going Up in Smoke. And actually, that's where I got the idea from that song was that ball that I seen. Yeah. It's wars and killings and cheating politicians and the government's getting too fat. At the time, it said, the oil's all gone. Congress may not like this song, but who could care? They've made the mess. The IRS is trying their damn best to drain the blood from you and me. Now, who in the hell through all of this would think we would live to see what we've done seen? And it says, we're going up in smoke. We're going to be relieved from all our sins. We're going up in smoke. I believe this world is going to end. Uh, and it was so controversial, they wouldn't put it on the radio. Mm -hmm. So that idea of what they were showing brought that kind of a thought to my mind. Mm -hmm. And I thought that would be a very frightening thing to say. I don't know if they meant that they were involved 
or that we were to see this to come to yeah. our future. Yes, yes. But we definitely or, 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 or maybe maybe they're in a sense telling us, taking extrapolating to the furthest degree what could happen. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway, we started this interview with a song and we ended it with a song and we got a little bit of exclusivity here for our readers, but then our readers deserve it more than anybody else because they've been dedicated to this yeah. for so many years. And Johnny, uh, it's such a pleasure to see you and talk to you after 34 years or however long it is. And I hope I see you in another 34 years. And God bless you and, and thank you for the, uh, the interview. And let's hope everybody watches the UFO Hunters on the History Absolutely. Channel. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mother.